Oh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. This is the last seminar of this term. And today we have a very special session, which is co-organized with the Wellbeing Research Center. Uh, because of this, the session will be moderated by Jan Emanuel Deneuve. He is director of the Wellbeing Research Center, and his research uh, focuses on, on the study of human well-being. His work has been published in Science, Nature, the Review of Economics and Statistics, and many similar uh, publications, uh, seminar journals. So without uh, further delay, I will just simply give the floor to, to, to Jan, which uh, we are happy to have him. And, and that's it for, for me today. Hi, Hector, and hi, everyone. It's a great privilege for me to be able to join the OFI uh, seminar series and, and, and play moderator at this particularly important session, I think, where we'll hear from Sabina and Fanny. Um, I think um, um, Sabina needs very little introduction, uh, but just in case, um, she is uh, the director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, uh, and she is obviously uh, very well known for her methods, uh, building on a capability approach, extending Amart Sam's work, and all the amazing impact that she's had uh, uh, around the world in terms of de developing multidimensional indices of poverty uh, and uh, human development. And then joining Sabina will be Fanny Kovesdi, who's been a research analyst at OFI for the last two or three years. Uh, and she's been working on the global MPI, the multi-dimensional uh, poverty index over that period, and is now contributing also to this particular multi-dimensional measure of well-being for the United Kingdom. Um, and so the title of the presentation is A Bird's Eye View of Well-Being, Exploring a Multi-Dimensional uh, Measure of Well-Being for the United Kingdom. Um, and the way this will work, for those of you not familiar with the OFI seminar series, is that um, Fanny and uh, uh, Sabina will be uh, speaking for about 40 minutes. Uh, I will make sure that they do not run over. Um, uh, and then so that we can leave about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, um, any questions that you may have, please uh, introduce them into the chat function. Uh, and then I will uh, essentially ask the question on your behalf. Um, a quick question though to Sabina and Fanny, would you mind if people have a clarifying question and I judge it relevant to sort of intervene and say, can you just briefly expand on this particular point? Is it, is it okay if, if perfect? Yeah. So if, you, if anyone in the audience has any urgent clarifying questions that are better posed while, during the presentation, please share and I'll, I'll use my judgment to see whether or not it's worthwhile uh, interjecting. Um, so without further ado, uh, over to uh, Sabina and Fanny for what is and sounds like a fantastic uh, subject and presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. And it's really exciting to be able to um, have this seminar joint with um, the Center on, on Wellbeing. And we really look forward to many different exchanges in the years to come. It's a really exciting development for me. Um, this paper with Fanny Covesti um, basically took form because the UN Human Development Report Office and wanted to have some background analyses of broader measures of human development. So that's its genesis. Um, it's on the way to becoming a background occasional working paper for the Human Development Report Office of UNDP. But I should also say that we're very grateful to colleagues in the ONS, Office of National Statistics UK, um, who have given us a very good support in terms of understanding the indicators of well-being and also the Understanding Society survey. We're also grateful to statisticians in Sweden's um, statistical authority for their reflections on this, the Swedish um, approach to well-being measurement. So um, we call it a bird's eye well view of well-being because what we are doing in this paper is we are trialing with a UK data set a single multidimensional measure of well-being. We call it the MWI or well-being index. I'm not sure how you'll pronounce it. There must be some creative way, MUI, um, that gives a bird's eye view of well being from the 30,000 foot perspective, 30,000 meter perspective. The policymakers could say basically, is well being in the UK going up and going down? Um, where is it highest? Where is it lowest? What groups are being left behind? And this could be tracked over time. And then this indicator, could also then be broken down 
to provide details of how to increase well-being, where um, well-being, in what dimensions, in what sectors, in what areas well-being is lagging and where it is progressing, what groups are progressing in different ways, what can be learned between different groups in the UK. So that's the, the problem that we wanted to look at. Um, so the motivation is really the opportunity that COVID gives us um, to reassess our priorities. Um, if you simply look in the news, if you look on social media, we can see that, oops, the pandemic um, brought a lot of things to mind. How is our mental health doing? Are we exercising? Um, are we lonely? How are our close relationships going now that they are um, all together at the same time, uh, working together, eating together, uh, living together? And then how the environment took a deep breath during the lockdowns, how education and the schooling of children and of university students came to the fore as a priority that needed to be thought about differently. Employment, the job loss, the insecurity, but also the meaningfulness of work to mental health. And then the very basics of, of food security. And so the question is whether the breath of COVID, um, which we hope is ending soon, also gives us a chance to reconfigure some of the understanding of the balance of priorities um, and to do this using a, an official national measure of well-being. Um, why do we need a headline measure? Um, and I think it's basically for perhaps not a technical reason, but for a, a policy reason, in order to create a visibility for well-being, it might be easier to have a headline um, that would shift the framework in governance because it would give a direction of travel, but also indicators for policy. It would be able to um, be a center point of discourses, both in the public sector and in um, the public more widely about well-being. Is it measured right? What's in it? What's out of it? Is it going in the right direction? But it would also, and this is our methodological point, we'd like to ground well-being in people's lives. We'd like to be able to interview people and for them to know whether or not their well-being is okay or not. And some of the complex measures or ginormous dashboards don't give us that option to say who, what are the group of people in the UK that have the highest well-being, to talk with them, to learn from them. Um, but also to disaggregate and um, many times, if you have combinations of data from many different sources, you can't disaggregate necessarily um, by the same units. Um, but in this time of uh, the pandemic, we need to confront inequalities, new inequalities, old inequalities, and try to think of how to reconfigure um, an equitable society. And then also, of course, um, think about what are policy actions in potentially novel areas, as well as traditional areas, of public policy. Um, and uh, we also observe that there is a disjuncture, which is, I think, very well known, but needs just to be named between um, GDP uh, measures of well being, the, uh, uh, the GDP per capita measures of the health of the economy, in a sense, that do not reflect the quality of life. And um, that's, a, a, I think, a very well known point. And the, there's been a lot of work. The Human Development Report that we are um, supporting in this research um, was a pioneer in thinking of a wider concept of human development in 1990, building on the conceptual framework of capabilities from Amartya Sen. But in measurement terms, the Human Development Index, revolutionary in its time, was, as Amartya Sen and Mahbub al Haq said at the very moment, it was vulgar, it was simple. All it wanted to do was catch the attention of policymakers and say the rankings of country by income and their rankings by a slightly better measure are very different. And that was the political point. But since that time, um, there's also been a call to have better and more precise, less vulgar measures of well-being. For example, the stiglitz Fitusi Commission 2009 and their 2019 two-volume follow-up uh, explore wider measures of well-being. Um, also, the International Panel on Social Progress out of Princeton, led by Mark Fleurbe, um, looked at a number of domains of well-being using academics across disciplines across the world um, to try to think more deeply about measurement um, uh, of different dashboards, uh, of different ways. So to date, 
in this broader expansion, we basically have two kinds of measurement tools. One are measures and the other are dashboards. So in terms of measures, most of the measures draw on the kind of composite structure of the human development index. There are a number of different variables. They may be normalized. They draw from different data sources. You get an aggregate across the society, aggregating across to all people, and then you aggregate across indicators to obtain a composite measure. So that's the general measurement framework of the Better Life Index of OECD, the Global Peace Index, the Social Progress Index, the Gotham Prosperity Index, etc. Um, the other measurement tool used by many governments are large dashboards of a number of different single indicators, but no overall total. Now, both, I think, are fantastic and they've brought the discourse forward a lot, but there are a couple difficulties one is that the dashboards don't have a, a clear message. Has well-being gone up or down or stayed the same? Well, in this indicator it has, in this indicator it's like this, this, like this. And if you have 41 indicators, your journalist has long gone off for coffee by the time you're explaining, finished explaining the trends. But also for policy, in, we know that there's criticisms sometimes of a single measure because it weights indicators. But if the weights reflect considered values, there's also a compact benefit in that otherwise policymakers do not know. And the Stiglitz San Fatusi original commission spoke of the problem of large eclectic dashboards because they don't make trade offs transparent. Um, and as I already mentioned, when there are different data sources, and so when you do combine into a single measure, but you do so for many different data sources you probably cannot disaggregate. Um, and yet this is really vital if you're thinking of intra-country inequalities. And then there are technical issues about weights um, and uh, marginal rates of substitutability um, in these kind of composite measures. So the approach that we draw on in this paper is the Gross National Happiness Index of Bhutan, which is a counting-based measure, similar but different from the at risk of poverty and social exclusion member measure of Eurostat, which Eurostat has implemented since 2010. The GNH index is a little bit more complex in two ways, in terms of the number of indicators and domains it considers, and in terms of the methodology of developing the overall index. Um, so Bhutan, as you probably know, since the 1970s, um, took forward the idea, articulated by His Majesty the Fourth King, um, that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. But in those days, it was not measured. Subsequently, in 2008, um, they began to measure this index because they felt it was necessary uh, to have a policy tool that made visible this underlying motivation. And um, it is a measure which gives a number which goes up or down over time, but it also has a gradient of different degrees of whether the word is happiness or the causes and conditions of well-being. And it has detailed information by indicator as well as by social groups. So that's a broad methodology that we use. Um, in terms of the concept of happiness, then the term is actually a misnomer perhaps because in Bhutan, Happiness is multidimensional, um, and so it has a very clear resonance with the Martia Sen's capability approach. And furthermore, it is not individualistic. Um, happiness includes other sentient beings. It includes the environment, and it includes relationships. I cannot be happy if our relationships are sour, if there is animosity, if the environment is not good. So um, in particular, the GNH index has nine domains health, education, and living standards, including income. Um, but then it has other areas of priority, like good governance, the environmental diversity, time use. Do you sleep enough? But it, then it has also slightly more innovative domains, including psychological well-being, cultural diversity, a dimension which was absent in the Sten Svetusi Commission, and um, community vitality. So those are the nine domains. And the aim really was to create a measure that both evaluated how GNH is trending over time and also 
could be informed in policies and programs and that is in place that we will not cover it today so before we go to the measure methodology briefly i'll just say what the vision is so what if across society we could say as Bhutan said that in the past five years well-being in britain has grown just like we could say in Bhutan between 2010 and 2015 GNH grew, the growth was statistically significant, and many population groups saw growth in their overall well being. But then, when we looked at how GNH grew, it was another interesting story. Every indicator in living standards increased significantly. Service delivery increased significantly, things like water and sanitation and rubbish disposal and those kind of things. The objective measure of health. The number of healthy days per month increased significantly. Um, and those were what drove growth. But equally interesting was to see what actually reduced statistically significantly, but did not dominate the trend. For example, the sense of belonging went down. Perceptions of government performance went down, although services went up. The perceptual indicators have a light weight but we recognize that the, the baseline was the first uh, democracy in Bhutan um, after national elections of a prime minister and a parliament. Um, and so, it, of course, it was at the top, the peak of um, satisfaction. So it went down a lot. That's the blue line in the middle. But the other worrying thing is that every single subjective indicator in psychological well-being went down. So average satisfaction with your quality of life People were less joyful, less generous, less kind. They were more angry, more frustrated, um, more anxious. Um, and they had uh, less uh, meditation, less consideration of the consequences of their actions ethically on others. And so that started a conversation about the direction of movement of the society, where you could see on one plane how we are doing an exercise, how we were doing in eating our five a day veg, how we are doing economically, how we are doing in relationships. So that is perhaps um, a benefit of a kind of multidimensional well-being measure. Briefly on the methodology, it is accounting-based methodology, um, but it is done the other way around. So you set you, a, a number of indicators, and for each indicator you ask what is sufficient. What is sufficient not to be happy, we don't know who's happy, but to create, in terms of public policy, the causes and the conditions that are sufficient to justifiably um, permit people to enjoy well-being. So those are the cutoffs. But then we are looking not at who's deprived initially, but we're looking at who has sufficiency. So instead of a deprivation score of 60%, you would have a sufficiency score of 40%. Um, so we're looking at the indicators in which you do enjoy the causes and conditions of well-being. And then across those sufficiency scores, you can set a cutoff. Um, actually, in the case of Bhutan, they set three cutoffs. They create a gradient, which we also do in this paper. Um, and so how much is enough to enjoy well-being, narrowly, deeply, moderately, or who is unhappy or lacks well-being or has a, a high, high, less favorable condition of well-being? And the result of this is to choose one cutoff for the national measure. And then you can say this is your MWI, which it should be not MPI. But you can like the MPI, you can talk about the incidence, the percentage of people who are enjoying favorable well-being conditions because they have sufficiency in at least X percent of the weighted indicators. And then we can talk about the average um, intensity, both of those who have sufficiency, but also of those who lack sufficiency. Because of the methodology, the properties such as disaggregation, dimensional breakdown um, are preserved. And I think the value of this that I touched on earlier is that it's person by person. So in a sense, a person could do this inter questionnaire for themselves and say, what is my well-being like? Uh, where am I lacking? Um, and it could be a, a conversation not only for public policy, but also for other sectors. And so very briefly, in terms of the formula, it's slightly different because it's a one minus, the GNH index is effectively one minus M0. And H 
uh, of the happy people or the people with favorable conditions is one minus the number of people who would be poor if you had from the same data considered the sufficiency cutoffs to be deprivation cutoffs and looked at the lacks. And so what the index is equal to is the percentage of people who are happy plus the product of the percentage of people who lack happiness or well-being and the average deprivation score. This is a deprivation score of those who lack happiness. So we could go into the mathematics. It's just algebra. You can work it out on paper. And it's a little bit the weak and strong cutoffs you have to work through. But it's a, a, a straightforward methodology. So I turn over now to Fanny to explain the UK and that situation and the indicators of the uh, MWI. Thank you very much, Spina. Hello, everyone. Um, so in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk quickly a little bit about the background of well-being measurement in the UK and then present you the multidimensional well-being index that we have created and the indicators. So this is not in no way exhaustive, but um, so in the UK, well-being has taken, um, there has been quite a lot of research um, done over the years, particularly by Lich Richard Layard, who has worked extensively on happiness. Um, however, the political momentum and the spotlight on, hap on uh, well-being has arrived in 2010 when um, then Prime Minister David Cameron has announced um, a shift away from GDP towards measuring um, well-being of society. So what this meant was that the government has commissioned um, some independent institutes such as the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, who has been publishing research and evidence on well-being, and also there were plans made for creating and incorporating national well-being indicators um, into a national measure of well-being by the Office, Office for National Statistics. So while the initial focus has been on psychological well-being, mainly informed by the research on happiness that has been previously done, um, there was an extensive national consultation in 2011 that highlighted what well-being meant to people in the UK, what were the areas they thought contributed most to their well-being. And this was combined with established knowledge from OECD, from the Better Life Index, to create a national measure of well-being. Oh, next slide, please. Oh, Sabine, thank you. Um, so the dashboard by the ONIS um, contains 10 domains and 41 indicators of well-being. So as Sabina mentioned, the, this provides quite a rich detail on well-being in the UK and is being regularly updated. However, being a dashboard, it does not provide an overall view of well-being and therefore it cannot track changes in well-being over time and due to some other issues with the um, level of identification it's not clearly able to communicate how certain groups uh, well-being improves or decreases over time um, and this is perhaps the reason and also perhaps the terminology around well-being and happiness that well-being the well-being dashboard and in general the well-being agenda is yet to catch up with the popularity of GDP. So although there has been significant improvements in academia mainly and also across many charities, so for instance there has been multiple indices published very lately the index of um, um, on well-being by the charity HUK that looked at um, well-being at people over 60, um, there has been no clear governance framework and no political parties or politicians that have taken on and put forward a well-being agenda. Um, nevertheless, there has been some improvements even in the political domain. So psychological well-being, especially the issue of loneliness, has received quite a lot of attention in recent years. There was a minister of minister a leader of loneliness appointed and a strategy put in place to tackle loneliness across all great age groups in the UK. And most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted issues such as exercise and domestic violence that contribute to people's well-being. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we can see the national well-being dashboard of the ONS and the 10 domains of well-being that they incorporated based on the national consultation. Um, so we can see that it, can, it has quite a lot of detail on 41 indicators um, and includes things such as personal well-being, so questions on life satisfaction, anxiety, happiness, 
that are measured at the individual level and vary across people, across society. But it also includes many what we call macro conditions. So things relating to the economy, such as inflation or public sector debt, um, indicators related to the environment, such as greenhouse gas emission, that are not directly related to individual well-being and do not vary across society. So again, as Sabina mentioned, the, the nature of the measure being a dashboard makes it difficult to get an overall sense of well-being across all of these indicators because there's just many of them and also they're measured at different levels. So next slide, please. Um, so our measure, the Multidimensional Wellbeing Index or MWI, um, takes its starting point from this owner's dash dashboard. Uh, however, um, we do two innovations, so-called. So one is we apply the Archive Foster methodology as adopted to wellbeing by the Coast National Happiness Index. And we use the individual as the unit of identification. So we, we use data on, for individuals for each of the indicators and then aggregate that into an index. And we use as opposed to the ONS dashboard that relies on data from multiple sources, such as you know, ONS data, understanding society, government departments. We only use data for all of our indicators from a single wave of understanding society, which is understanding society is the one of the largest running panel surveys in the world. And it collects uh, information on many domains of well-being and also on some economic conditions, material deprivation and so on. It covers all age groups. However, um, since we need that we use questions that are in the adult questionnaire, we only consider people age 16 and over for this um, round of the um, well-being index. And next slide, please. So the 41 to indicators of the ONS, we retain 19 indicators that we managed to um, proxy from our data and include seven additional indicators um, to get a total of 26 that are included in the MWI. So here I'll just walk you through very briefly on the indicators and perhaps there will be more questions about this later on. So there are nine indicators in total where um, we are exactly, we're not changing anything, we're retaining the indicators. This is partly due to ON the ONS measure actually using these indicators from a understanding society or for indicators such as unemployment or low income when there's a very clear definition and we're able to recreate the exact same figure using our data. So there's been no change for those. In two of the indicators, loneliness and the GHQ, the general health questionnaire indicator that relates to mental, mental health and um, evidence of depression, the ONS measure uses the average score to track changes in those indicators. However, due to the methodological um, requirements of the index, we introduce a cutoff for both of those um, to be able to distinguish between people with sufficiency and who lack sufficiency in those indicators. In three indicators, we introduce a stricter cutoff. So for disability, we introduce a second condition that matches to the official government definition in exercise, we match to the NHS's guidance on minimum exercise. And for the educational qualifications, we raise it from no qualifications to A levels or equivalent to get a higher sense of educational qualifications, which require which we deem to be necessary for a certain level of well-being. Um, in there are oh, let me just move my screen. There are five indicators um, which we are able to proxy from the original dashboard. However, they are not exactly available in understanding society. So for these ones, we had to introduce some modifications to the content of the indicators, as well as the cutoffs. So for instance, while the worthwhile uh, unhappiness and anxiety indicators come from the annual population survey in the owner's dashboard, we don't have the exact same direct questions asking a person whether they felt anxious um, recently or in the last week. Therefore, we have to use different. So for instance, we use the GHQ um, items to recreate these variables. Um, and for social networks and belonging, again, we combine data from multiple um, questions into a single indicator. 
to proxy what was available in the ONS measure. And we also include seven new indicators. Um, so some of these have been included, for instance, evidence for depression. You will see in the next slide that we have introduced multiple measures. And this was, we included this to trial out how different, how direct question on depression or the general GHQ works and whether this makes a difference to how well-being is scored. Um, we include fruit and vegetable consumption, so your five a day, this has been kind of a clear policy priority um, of the government. Instead of including trust in government, which was not available, we include an indicator on political efficacy. And we also add some indicators relating to material living conditions, so that's either adequate heating or whether a person owns or rents their house. Next slide, please. So these are just, again, a snapshot of the total 19 indicators that were retained and the seven that we added for the MWI. So this is the earn, original earners dashboard. And what I've done here is I, in black, I kept the ones that we retained from the dashboard. In gray are the ones that we are unfortunately not able to recreate or indicators that refer to macro conditions like the economy and therefore we exclude it. And in red are the indicators that we have um, added to the measure, or in the case of sports participation and neighborhood belonging, which have the stars, they have been moved to new dimensions, um, which we'll, you will see in the next slide. The next, please. So we have done multiple trial measures with trying different indicators, different combinations for the dimensions and also different weights. Um, this is two of the trial measures that we present in the paper and that we decided to include here. So you can see that overall of the 10 original domains that were in the owner's dashboard, we keep seven of them. And we also add an, an additional dimension for living standards. So something that we could not include were the um, indicators on the environment. And I'll touch a little bit about this later. So I highlighted in, in blue here, um, to emphasize some of the different approaches and different trials that we wanted to do. So in measure one, this is the one that reflects most closely the dashboard um, used by ONS. So we have a personal well-being dimension that includes life satisfaction, feeling worthwhile, unhappiness and anxiety, all of which are weighted equally. Then we also have a health dimension that have some indicators um, that also touch on mental health. So for instance, evidence of depression which here uses the, the, um, the direct question asking a person whether they felt down or depressed in the last four weeks, while the personal well-being dimension uses the questions from the general health questionnaire due to data constraints. So this is the one, the measure one is the one closest to the ONS original measure. And in measure two, um, we have taken a different approach and decided to use all 12 GHQ questions combined and scored in a single indicator on the health dimension called evidence of depression. And for the personal well-being, we moved all satisfaction indicators into one dimension and weighted them equally um, as a proxy of personal well-being. Next slide, please. Um, and as Sabina mentioned, um, we also followed the, some of the weighting um, that was done in the GNH index of Bhutan. So we want to make sure that if we have, you know, if we, you have this index and you want to track well-being over time, that the subjective indicators and the ones asking about people's perceptions are not influencing the index um, and not causing spikes um, over time. So what we've done here is in dimensions where there was a mix of objective and subjective indicators, we allocated a smaller weight to the subjective indicators. So for instance, in the what we do dimension, we have unemployment, which receives 664th of the weight, and we have job satisfaction and satisfaction with leisure time, which receives, each of them receives one eighth of the dimensional weight. And yeah, I forgot to say this, but the dimensions are all weighted equal. So they all receive one eighth of the total weight. And then the indicators you can see across measure one and measure two, that in most of the dimensions, they're weighted equally with the exception of the ones that I've highlighted here in red. Next slide, please. Uh, 
thank you. So as, uh, as mentioned before, one of the, the, the advantages of using a well-being index as opposed to a dashboard is that we are able to get an overall sense of well-being across the population. Um, and using the archive foster method, we can also apply different cutoffs and segment society into multiple gradients. So in the, multi in the MWI, what we've done is we have applied four different cutoffs based on the weighting structure and segmented society into five well-being gradients ranging from high to low well-being. So people with high well-being um, are deprived in one eighth or less of the total indicators, while those with low well-being are only have sufficiency in less than half of the total indicators. And across the five gradients, to help policymakers um, improve well-being and focus on those with less favorable well-being, we created a binary with where high and decent categories were put into what we call favorable well-being. So these are people who enjoy sufficiency in three quarter or more of the indicators, while those with less favorable well-being are deprived in more than in more than one third of the weighted indicators. Next, please. Next slide, please. Do you see it? No, it's still the same for me. Uh oh, my net might be low. Well, I, I'll, I'll just uh, recap recap quickly. Um, so, in the next slide, um, I was just going to mention the some of the limitations that um, the MWI has. So. Um, as you've seen, unfortunately, we're not able to recreate many of the domains that are included in the ONS measure um, due to data constraints. So while we have the advantage of using oh, advantage of using um, a single data source, um, this has meant that we were not able to incorporate, for instance, the environment dimension, which we would deemed to be an essential part of well-being, and this is something that we would want to, in future attempts, incorporate, either whether that's linking to, to geographical data or trying different data sources and such. Um, another thing to note with understanding society, that while it contains a very, very large number of indicators and is very rich on, on indicators of well-being, it, um, it unfortunately has a repetitive, um, um, it basically some modules are issued every two or three years, which means that it's difficult to get some of the indicators and some consistency if you want to track well-being over time and some of the modules can be present in one wave and not the other. Um, but nevertheless, yep. um, the well-being index um, shows how you can incorporate well-being in a single summary measure and it actually reveals quite stark inequalities across the UK, which Sabina will now talk a little bit about. Thank you can so I, much. Um, Sabina, if I can just interject uh, very briefly, um, we have about a minute left. So if we can move towards uh, concluding. Um, no, we started at three and a half minutes past. And so I'll go until 43 and a half. Um, I can no longer see my screen. Um, so I don't know how to do this. Um, so I think um, what um, Fanny has done is been to put forward the indicator and I'll share the results now. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to share that this is not, um, these are not results for you to take seriously. We are ourselves not satisfied with the indicators of the MWI. And if you are not, please join us. Please help us to improve them, particularly if you are from ONS or if you know um, understanding society measures. Fanny has made many more indicators and many more trial measures, um, but we are showing these results to illustrate what an adequate measure could be, recognizing that at present, we don't think these indicators are it yet. Um, but that being said, according to our measures between 44% in measure one and 51.5% in 0.3% in measure two, of the population of the UK who are 16 and above enjoy favorable conditions of well-being in three quarters or more of their weighted indicators. 
Um, so the MWI, if measure one is 0.79, and if measure two is 0.82. Um, next slide. We are able, because it is an individual level measure, to look at the gender gaps and the per percentage point differences in women's uh, versus men's attainments in the different indicators. And so you can see here that on the left hand side are those in which women have lower sufficiency and in the right uh, fruit and veg are where men have lower sufficiency. Um, next slide. But there are quite stark inequalities when we disaggregate in any way, in different ways. And I'll just show you two of them. The first is disaggregation by age cohort in decadal cohorts. We find that those enjoying highest well-being, according to this measure, are those aged 70 and above, and next highest are in their 60s, and next highest are teenagers. But if you are in your 20s, or particularly in your 30s, it's off going. Um, just 35% of those in their 30s enjoy favorable conditions of well-being um, for this measure. Next slide. But I think what really drew our attention was disparities across ethnic groups. So, for example, if we look at those who self-classify their ethnicity as white, 52.6% um, of them enjoy favorable well-being. But among those who are of other ethnic groups, it's only 34.8, um, 34.5%. And if you are West Indian, Black, African, Black British, it's just 268 and I think there's a value in having an overall optic on well-being that similarly looks at the well-being of minorities and of different age groups. Next slide. A question naturally is whether the MWI replicates data that might be obtained, for example, from life satisfaction. And so we did a simple cross tab of those. And to summarize the measures, um, it's a slightly more complicated graphic below. Um, but we crossed all of the five groups of well-being with those who considered themselves satisfied or dissatisfied um, because that question is one of those evaluative life satisfaction is one summary measure of well-being used in many documents. And we found the mismatches can be significant. So that is um, a, a consideration. Last slide. So then we can look at the indicators of those who are not having favorable well-being, and we can look at where they are insufficient, and we can see how we can increase uh, well-being, whether it is focusing on relationships or employment or fruit and veg and exercise at the two extremes. Um, so we see that those on the right hand have lower sufficiency, and so investment in those indicators, um, considering their weights, would be um, the priorities in terms of increasing well-being for those who face unfavorable conditions. So I think it's the last slide now. Um, I think that's been what we wanted to focus on and simply uh, acknowledge that this is an exploratory exercise. It's illustrating a methodological approach to measurement, which we believe could have some salience in policy, but we are doing it recognizing that while Fanny has wrestled with understanding society, we've tried to do our best. We're not quite there with the indicators, but we hope working in partnership with others, we would be able to move forward. And perhaps in other countries with other data sets, there would also be interesting avenues to explore. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Fanny. Maybe I should applaud on behalf of everyone. <laughs> It'll be hard to imitate about 60 people or so applauding, but um, thank you very much indeed. We, uh, I should also applaud the people, the attendees uh, listening in uh, for their amazing and excellent questions. I will be surprised if we can get to all of them, but I do hope and we should take note of all the questions that are in the chat function and share them with you, uh, Sabina and Fanny, to, to, because some of these are, are excellent feedback. Um, so let's try and move quickly to some of the questions uh, that kind of come together. So maybe the first one from Samuel Mc, McQuillan, uh, but briefly, um, if you will, uh, Fanny or Sabina. Could you discuss the Understanding Society survey a bit more? Who administers, who administers it? How regularly is it published? And especially, why was this one chosen over another source of data? 
So, Fanny, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Understanding Society is a panel survey in the UK that has been running since 2010, but it also incorporates about 6,000 households of the previous British household panel survey that has been running since 1990. So, it's a very large survey. Um, and it also collects information on all age groups. So it has a child and youth questionnaire that we do not use for this um, version of the wellbeing index, but that we could be incorporated. Um, it is representative um, of all age groups or regions, and it also includes an ethnic minority and immigrant boost sample, which means that the results are representative for all ethnic groups in the UK. Um, so these were main facts. Th this was one of the factors that led us to, to use this. And another one being that some of the original ONS indicators also rely on understanding society. And it had many of the indicators available from which we could recreate the multidimensional poverty or well-being index. Um, there are many other surveys. However, this is one of the largest ones and the one with the most extensive, extensive information on well-being. Uh, thank you, Fanny. Um, an important and very substantive question. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll combine Sylvia Brunetti and Mark Fabian's questions here. Um, can you please elaborate again on the reasons behind the weighting choices? And so if I took uh, good notes, it's uh, the dimensions themselves, the 10 dimensions are weighted equally, but it's within the indicators that you're um, uh, applying specific weights. And so the reason behind that, and then linked to that question, Mark Fabian asks, is there a way, is there a way to democratize the, uh, this internal weighting of these indicators and to what extent is there room for politics essentially coming in and reweighting in function of the kind of results they like to see some of these indicators underlying dimensions versus others and then building on that he asks have we seen anything of that sort of manipulation potentially happening in uh, Bhutan GNH? Thank you so much I'll have a go at this. Um, so this, these are trial weights and this is a first paper but the dimensions are weighted equally though living standards could be combined with housing you know there are many reservations we might have about that the domain dimensional structure within dimensions the principle was that the dimension of subjective well-being has to have a full weight on subjective indicators however for public policy there can be um, concerns if an objective indicator like unemployment is equally weighted with job satisfaction or satisfaction with leisure time then policymakers might be a little bit frustrated if unemployment went down, but people became less satisfied with their jobs, perhaps because of a change in frame of reference. And so in Bhutan, the trend, uh, the, the weights were lighter on the subjective indicators that were within objective domains where the main uh, public policy um, understanding was that the, the indicator is to affect the objective indicator. So that was the one that we trialed. If this were to go forward, then what we have done in other measures, for example, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, has been to exhaustively um, uh, robustify the measure to a set of different weights of two kinds. One is a range of plausible weights that reflect differing values across the society. Um, so these could indeed come from public exercises like the My World Survey or like the OECD, but be collected and then implemented. And the question there is, are the policy salient results robust to a range of plausible weights? Um, and if so, then that's an interesting finding in itself. And so far in the poverty measures, we do find to a plausible range of weights, um, most of the policy conclusions across many different MPIs are robust, but not to the full range of weights. So there's also an exercise of, across the full range of weights which can be done for academic purposes and usually finds radically uh, different results um, that are not robust. And that is itself interesting and giving an independent argument for why a multidimensional index does add value over any single indicator. Um, finally, um, in terms of political manipulation, that is certainly not in evidence. Um, from the beginning in Bhutan, there was a decision that the nine domains on a conceptual basis were to be equally considered because this is a balanced approach to development. And the technical people um, did the, both the suggestion of giving a light weight to subjective, particularly the perceptions of government performance and the subjective health indicators. Because in fact, 
given the shift in frames of reference, subjective and objective indicators moved in opposite directions. As people had road access and access to electricity, their health expectations changed. Um, so there was not evidence of political manipulation, but that's something always to consider. And the reason that we do the robustness test is precisely to make transparent the fact that if you disagree a little bit with my weights, it's not going to change the policy conclusions. Over. Thank you, Sabina. Um, that's a, a, an exhaustive and a, a hopefully complete answer to, to the, these good questions. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan Clausen um, wrote uh, the paper by Emma Salmon that was part of OFI's Missing Dimensions of Poverty project presented quite a strong position against including against including mental health indicators as components of poverty, arguing that mental health is more than the absence of illness. I was wondering if you follow such an approach in this paper. Thank you. Greetings, Jonathan. It's lovely to hear from you. Um, so this is a measure of well-being, not of poverty. And so it, because well-being is more ample in terms of the domains of interest, it does seem appropriate in this case to use the subjective indicators, whereas Emma Saman and Ofi have not advised governments to use subjective well-being as a dimension of poverty. But clearly for well-being, it, it um, has a different place. And so I would just say that um, we maintain that distinction in terms of poverty measures, not considering subjective well-being perhaps as a core element, but in terms of well-being, I think now it has to be. I don't know, others may wish to respond. No, I mean, I, I agree completely. And I think, you know, both from political and public discourse and what we learn from academia, we can see that, you know, mental health and psychological well-being is is an important part of overall well-being. And I think, you know, this was shown in the national consultations as well, both by the ONS and also the ones done in Bhutan. So I think we should definitely, you know, consider that as a part of well-being. Uh, thank you both. Um, Two questions. Um, um, besides mental health, people also raise the issue of safety, safety and security being critically important for people's well-being. And then Nikolai also notes the employment is certainly important, uh, as we know uh, from other research as well. Uh, but maybe first uh, um, on the safety and security aspects, uh, uh, I'm reading uh, Richard Lutz's question here, are critical to include, even if hard to measure. Around the world, insecurity is increasing, so these measures in the UK won't be usable elsewhere. Security will perhaps unravel in the UK in the future. It will become the elephant in the room. Can you include this somehow? So are there measures of safety and security that can be included? Uh, and this was I'll be very quick oh. and Fanny can do more. Go ahead. I was just going to say this. Uh, there was a, an echo of this in Deborah Hardoon's of the What Work Center uh, question as well around safety and security. Yeah, um, certainly Bhutan's measure does have security in it. Um, and it is very possible to include that indicator if it is in a survey um, or if individual level data are available from something else, of course, that's possible. Or everybody in a particular census district or enumeration area could use administrative records about levels where a cutoff was set. So there are different ways of merging data that we can talk about separately. But I think it's possible. I think one of the difficulties is that the question, particularly, do you feel safe walking alone at night, um, also is a bit controversial in that sometimes the people who were report the highest uh, concern are those with the lowest probability of actually experiencing an objective condition of violence. And I think it really would be the objective incidence of experiencing violence that a well-being measure should focus on, not perceptions. But that might be you know, up for grabs by others. Similarly, we were very um, unsatisfied with the unemployment indicator. Um, and so we would just welcome help in figuring out a, a better way to measure that dimension that's so important. Um, Fanny. Yeah, so just to add to that um, on the physical safety, um, unfortunately, understanding society only asks about whether a person feels safe walking home from the people in the ethnic minority boost sample. So it's a very small sample size, about one to 2%. Uh, so we have not considered this, but this is definitely something that we would like to incorporate. And also the ONS domain includes um, crime as one of the indicators. And I think there are some additional ones relating to one's physical environment. And on employment, um, just to respond to Nikolai, yes, that's definitely an area that we were not happy with. Um, unfortunately, there are no quality of um, work indicators um, in understanding society, or at least not in this wave. So some of the previous ones have modules that have been 
introduced um, periodically to ask more questions related to employment, but in this round that was not administered, so we couldn't include that. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you both. Uh, Julie Selwyn uh, has a quick reaction on this, though. Do you feel safe in your home? She finds that this is both a physical and uh, this is both physical and psychological safety. Um, and then um, the question around the unemployment. Um, uh, Nikolai suggested hours worked versus desired hours to work, contract type, or other job characteristics, and perhaps be used and referring to job quality. Um, so these are our questions there. Um, I'm, uh, there's a number of questions that we've kind of touched upon, they're quite similar. Um, I'm wondering um, if uh, Fanny or Sabine, if, you, if there's anything that, 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 you would, that you find particularly interesting that you would really want to respond to now. Some people have provided comments, so I know obviously Michael Plant uh, said a comments about drivers, I mean means and ends, um, uh, and subjective well-being. Um, and a number of other comments. Is there anything that you would like to take on all the relationship here with COVID-19 at the end? Very briefly, um, it is disaggregated in the paper by geographic units um, and uh, there are disparities there as well. Though with this, the error bars, they're not, they're not so big. Um, but also um, to really in terms of Welsh uh, Wellbeing for Future Generations Act or others, this is really a a first thing, a first paper, but we would be very, very interested in having other conversations of other data sets or places where a more well worked out trial in terms of the indicators um, and the policy priorities could be, you know, explored on academic turf before anything else. Um, but no, I, I over to Fanny. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that point, and I think in the UK that has definitely been kind of loads of approaches so you have what what was mentioned in 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 the chat about the welsh approach and i know that in scotland there is also well-being um, framework um for monitoring policies but there is that so have, there's been a lot of developments and you know many charities many institutes have created their own well-being indices or dashboards um but there has not been kind of a political overarching kind of statement on you know how we incorporate well-being and, and how we use the ONS dashboard that is an official national statistics covering all four nations of the UK and how to kind of incorporate that and create a unified well-being framework and an agenda that everyone can agree to and that can be also part of the public discourse and, and shared with people to get their their opinions and inputs. Thank you maybe um, there's some uh, good interesting questions that arrived but maybe if I, if I can ask one, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and it's, um, it builds on, I know there's weightings amongst the indicators and, 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 you, and you do your very best. Amongst the uh, dimensions, however, the 10 dimensions, just like with the GNH, there's no particular weighting being attached to either one. Um, they kind of sum up and come together in the overarching score an equal, an equal, an equal, with equal weights, literally. Um, but I'm wondering if you take the perspective of a prime minister or a mayor, um, and um, they have finite resources and they need to allocate money somewhere. Um, would you recommend them to spend it equally across these 10 dimensions uh, to try and raise well-being? Or would you suggest that they um, uh, prioritize one or another in order to optimize on well-being somehow? That's a fantastic question. And um, so I think that uh, when one knows the composition of insufficiencies, so the, the cutoff is, is there sufficiency in terms of GHQ or sufficient income? And so you have a, an income bar set or sufficient housing quality. And when you see the, the, the composition of insufficiencies, then the question from the public policy is, uh, how do we uh, address these in the most cost effective way and also in a way that leaves no one behind in terms of the poorest and the minorities? So to do that, you have to think of the unit cost of moving uh, these deprivations and also the eff efficacy of governmental versus other institutional responses. And I think that's a, a complex question, but not too complex. I think that a lot of, um, and we can show how other countries do it on their poverty budgets, um, do different simulation exercises, different ways of exploring um, the link between public expenditure and the impact on MWI. What we don't want is a gaming to just get the barely poor people over. So we don't want only a focus on the headcount ratio. We want the focus on the MWI because it includes the people 
who are very much uh, with the least levels of, of, of well-being and it will move if their well-being moves, whereas the headcount ratio will not. Wonderful. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Fanny. I think we're just at the hour mark. Um, I will have to go to quite literally because my lecture starts for the undergraduates um, and, uh, um, and that has kept us to a, a short timing. I'm incredibly grateful to all the attendees, uh, all 48, 50 of you, uh, and some of the amazing questions. I do hope we keep a record of this chat and, and, and pass it on to Fanny and Sabina. Um, and thank you both Sabina and Fanny for uh, amazing work and putting in, putting in this work to trial uh, with through trial and error to come up with a, a, a multidimensional well-being index. Uh, and I'm sure it will, uh, it will have a long life and will be heavily discussed and debated and hopefully improved as, as we move along. Thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Emanuel. Um, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Fanny and Sabina. Uh, with this seminar, we conclude the, the, the whole series where we have discussed the many uh, aspects of poverty and in this case, well-being. Uh, it's a complex, uh, complex concept that we will continue reflecting on next year uh, in the next seminar. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sabina. And thank you, Fanny. And we hope to see you next year. Thank you. And have a wonderful break until then. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, Ricardo, for a wonderful job in organizing these seminars. And thank you, Emmeline and Freya, for a fantastic backstopping of them. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.